Hey guys, this is Cameron Bowen, Tim from Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-1-2. Hello, team. Welcome to Scream Something. My name is Rich, and I am here with my co-host, Emily. Hey, everyone. In Scream Something, Rich and I will be sharing our initial thoughts, reactions, and just general screaming for the episodes of Season 3 that were released last Friday. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, we promise, but we'll be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the mid-season finale. Gather up. Oh, someone's come bearing gifts. I think I love gifts. Yes, I do love gifts. Super suits. One for you, Violet. Sorry, super suit, sorry. And one for you, Brion. Thank you. As you have clothing for action, now I do too. And, of course, it is form-fitting, as you superheroes seem to prefer. Some of us. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. Hello, Megan! So, the titles for this week's episode are Evolution, Triptych, and Home Fires. Not Home Fries. Uh, (laughs) The release date was January 18th of 2019, And the in-episode dates were from September 8th to September 30th. So we've got about a month in these three. The directors for this week were Christopher Berkeley, Mel Zwire, and Vinton Huke, which is still what we're going with unless someone corrects us. (laughs) And the writers were Brandon Vietti, Peter David, and Greg Weissman. Just in time for your next mission. So in our pre credit scene, we're introduced to Cassandra, who is apparently the daughter of Vandal Savage and Olympia, who gives her a book of Vandal Savage's life, which dates back to prehistoric times. He's been around for a while. Also, there's an alien Amrata approaching Earth and Vandal has to stop it. A lot happens. After the credits, we see the Outsiders team on the beach near Mount Justice, where Nightwing gives them their new super suits and everyone starts training. Well, in flashbacks, we see Vandal Savage kill a giant bear, and in the present, Vandal and Lex Luthor discuss what to do about the alien armada and decide that the only course of action is for Vandal to attack with the War World. When the War World has no effect on the armada, or minimal effect anyway, and uh, another armada approaches from the other side of the planet, Vandal enlists the help of Darkseid. Nightwing... Talks about balance, and in flashbacks, a meteor turns Vandal Savage into the first metahuman. In even more flashbacks, we see Vandal's first encounter with Darkseid in the 13th century. Vandal and his superpowered sons apparently impressed Darkseid enough that they were able to make a deal to conquer the galaxy together, knowing there would eventually be a final battle between Earth and Apocalypse, winner takes all. Also, in present times, Black Lightning and Dr. Jace are on a date. That's also a thing. That's happening. (laughs) And back on the beach, the kids pick superhero names. And back in space, (laughs) Calabac, Darkseid's son, shows up in space and takes down most of the armada by using a metahuman as a bomb, essentially. And Vandal puts Cassandra in charge of the world world. In yet another flashback, we see Vandal in Babylonia fighting alongside two of his children, one of whom is named Nabu and is wearing the helmet of fate. And we do not have time to unpack all that right now. (laughs) (laughs) And they are fighting against something called the star creature. That's apparently trying to enslave mankind. In present times, it turns out that the same creature is controlling the alien armada and Vandal fights against it in space, defeating it and stopping this new alien invasion. And apparently the light was first created by Vandal and his daughter Ishtar after they first defeated the star creature in Babylonia. A lot's happening. (laughs) And finally, after saving the Earth, Vandal kills Olympia, his aging daughter, to prevent her from accidentally revealing any of his plans by keeping the journal that we saw her give Cassandra at the beginning of the episode. Which is also a lot of unpacking. (laughs) Uh, 
<laughs> rolling into episode eight. Yeah, I know. The flashbacks do not stop in episode eight as we open with Nightwing recounting a mission to Oracle. Uh, three metahumans, Shade, Mist, and Livewire, break into Star Labs and steal a thing. We don't know what it is. Chesh <laughs> yet. Cheshire shows up, apparently also part of their team, but gets shot during the escape. After the credits, the Outsiders team, minus Superboy, head to Detroit to intercept Cheshire's team and hopefully get info from Cheshire. Our heroes face off against the thieves after grounding their plane, while Artemis confronts her sister and learns that the League of Shadows is being run now out of Santa Prisca. But Cheshire then escapes with Shade. Back in the present, uh, we've got Tim recounting a mission to Batman, where apparently Robin and his new squad attract a disguised and mind-controlled Clayface back to the Mad Hatter's lair, where he's experimenting with new mind-control tech on metahumans. So, at Mad Hatter's lair, Robin's team shows up, fights a bit, Mad Hatter escapes in the chaos, and then blows up the building. <laughs> of course they do. And, yeah. And back in the present, Calder and McGann basically video call, hologram call Wonder Woman to explain yet another mission to her. Because uh, apparently a few weeks back, a prisoner convoy was attacked by Sportsmaster and Kadabra, who escaped with a metahuman who would later become Shade, one of the thieves in the first flashback, after being experimented on by the Mad Hatter. And in our ending twist, we find out that all of these missions were connected, and the present conversations we were seeing uh, in little bits and pieces were actually all happening in the same room because everyone is involved in breaking up a new meta-trafficking ring, but as Wonder Woman points out, they're all kind of lying to their respective teams, which isn't great, and they could all be in giant legal trouble with the un by the end of this uh yeah this is definitely you gotta pay attention to the timestamps in this one because it's um, all told in reverse order in reverse order yes very art art studio wait what art house <laughs> i don't know what is that called you're a theater major <laughs> but i'm not a film major oh that's fair that's fair i personally all right, refer to it as backwards time <laughs> that's fair <laughs> okay, now on to episode nine. The light's planning something again, which which starts with them contracting Lobo, aka the main man, to kill Forager. On Earth, we've got the Justice League and Star Labs opening a metahuman youth support center, and Iris West Allen is apparently holding a super powered play date <laughs> for all of the children and parents who are not out on missions, I guess, of the hero community, which is being observed from across the street by some shadowy, strange language speaking figure. While McGann goes off to work at Happy Harbor High, Superboy, Tigress, and the Outsiders meet up at a quarry for today's training where they're attacked by Nightwing as a test. The test is interrupted by Lobo, of course, as he arrives to attempt to kill Forager. A fight breaks out because, of course, it does. <laughs> uh, back at Superpower Daycare, we learn that the shadowy figure across the street is actually the disgraced Ocean Master from season one and the tie-in comics, who's planning to kill everyone in the house, or at least most of the people he can in the house. However, he is stopped and killed by Lady Shiva, since the light refuses to let anyone use this, what they call, nuclear option to destabilize the Justice League, unless absolutely necessary. The fight against Lobo continues, and it appears that he's killed Forager, but turns out he just smashed the exoskeleton Forager <laughs> removed and threw at him as a diversion. Finally, we find out the light's plan is way more complicated than we thought, and that both Lady Shiva and Granny Goodness, founder of Good World Studios, have now joined its ranks. So this we... was as brief as we could possibly make these people because there is so much going on in all of these episodes. There's a lot. <laughs> you, you don't if you haven't watched them, and you can, you should do that instead of just listening to ours, because we glossed over so much. I did. I skipped over so much writing this, guys, because I was just like, um, so that's cool and important, but it's not plot relevant at the moment, so we're just going to charge right through. <laughs> yeah, got to go. Got to get it done. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's do some Aster. Ugh, yes. So many feelings. And, and you know what? We'll just say right now, you're going to need to come back for our single episode deep dives because we're just going to be glossing over this we got to keep this at a yeah. reasonable time time frame yes Superboy, are you all right i'm fine feeling the aster 
Want me to jump in first? Yeah, go for it. So I want to start with one negative because it's going to be my only negative and then we'll move on to... I'm backing up your your negative yeah. here too. We're on the same page. So we can then move on to all the stuff that we do love about these episodes. And it's that I finally have a complaint about this season it's, and it's that I really want to see Halo die less. Like it's, I, I'm done with the dying. It's I getting mean, excessive. It's four maybe times episode twenty four or twenty five. I don't know. Like we 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 get the point. And this this one was super. Yeah. This one was more graphic than I needed. I genuinely looked away from my screen because I was like, ah, no, I don't, I don't need that image today. And I understand why they're doing it because they can push the boundaries now, and they want to be able to do that, and it's to reinforce how indestructible she is. But I don't like it, and the violence is getting. A lot more brutal than I feel it needs to be, and it's not sitting right with me. And I'd like like a little less Halo dying. Like I get it. And maybe if these episodes were spaced out more as like one a week, it might not be as obvious to us how much it is and how much it's happening. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. But yeah. And the fact that we've gotten three weeks of episodes and she's died at least once every single week. I'm like, I'm good. I get it. I understand her powers. <laughs> Please stop brutalizing Halo. Agreed. But moving on to happier things that we do love, because that's my only real complaint right now. Yes. Episode seven, I absolutely love the adorable training montage with the outsiders. It's real cute. It's real nice throwback to season one, seeing everybody getting a handle on their powers and seeing how all these kids interact and seeing our season one team being mentors. It's just it's heartwarming and adorable. Including yeah. the Outsiders modified version of Maneuver 7, which is the exact same. It's a rad same, Maneuver 7. It's so I have to cool. Because it's yeah. the exact same thing, just taken up like 12 notches. It is still a weaponized cheerleader throw, but now with geo powers and glowing. And and Forager, and forager. being fast, fastball special that people, which I am all about. One thing that Neil pointed out uh, in our notes that I actually had to go back and rewatch again, he was like, I thought Mount Justice was destroyed. Like, this looks like – I went back and rewatched it and it, it's definitely it's definitely messed up. Like, it collapsed yeah. in on itself. But the mountain kind of still looks like it's there. Yeah, a little bit. So, but if you, com- if you compare it to the, other, to the other stuff, you can see where like part of it was blown off and, and clearly collapsed and then it's been several years now. So, the – regrowth has happened. So I'm pretty sure that's what's going on there. But I was the same. I was like, when I went back to think about it in my head, I was like, oh yeah, it was in the background. And then uh, it went from based on Neil's like prompting, I went back and rewatched it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Moving on also in episode seven. So there's this whole thing with uh, Dr. Jace and Jefferson and I predicted it back in yeah. episode four and didn't say anything because I was like, oh, you're no. thinking too hard about this. You're overthinking. They're not going to they're not going to go there. This you're you're just seeing things. And then they we went, went into there. a whole thing. Yeah. Emily and I had a whole behind the scenes conversation about this a while ago where I was like, I, I just got confused about ages. I think because um, <laughs> Brion, the Brion. sideburns on Brion, the Wolverine sideburn thing going on makes him look like he's 30. Yeah. So like I was bit. there's that scene in the early episode in the first episode I think where he kisses Jace on the forehead and she's kind of looking at him and I was like is this going to be a thing and then I didn't realize I just I don't think I knew at the time and they haven't really made it clear that he's supposed to be like 17 right yeah, cuz they cuz they he's 17 oh, cuz they mentioned he's that twins. he's twins with the other one right. who they explicitly tell us is 17 yes. so you just got to keep up <laughs> he still looks older than his brother though with yeah. those sideburns I think it's a sideburn thing <laughs> it's the sideburn yeah, but then when you pointed it out to me, and then she says in here that she's in her 30s, I was just like, oh, yeah, okay, that's creepy. Yeah, okay, that wasn't a thing. No. <laughs> that was me reading something into something else. But um, That was confusion I'm kinda, via sideburns. I'm kind of loving that. I'm kind of loving <laughs> – I wonder what's, what's their shipper name? Somebody's got to have a ship name. We'll see. I haven't, I haven't seen yet. But I'll, I'll Dr. See. Lightning? <laughs> No, no, <laughs> no. Oh, I that an, sounds like a I got an F. <laughs> I was given an I was given an given an F by Emily. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see what we'll see what the fandom does if they come up with anything. We just gotta wait and see. Yeah, apparently I'm not qualified. <laughs> <laughs> no, because that just sounds like another character. If someone was like, "Yeah, man, Doctor Lightning," I'd be like, "What super villain is that? I haven't heard of them yet." <laughs> I don't know. Blue Pulse sounds like a superhero. I'm just saying. Anyway, <laughs> not all you blue pol- pulse shippers out there. All right, move so, on to the next thing. We're already off track. We're pulling it back, keeping it on track, keeping this train going <laughs> where it needs to be. 
So also in the same episode, I was very happy to see Cheshire again. We saw her in the trailer and I was very happy to see her in the trailer, but getting to see her show up made me so happy. She won my favorite villains. (laughs) I saw her show up and I was like, oh, Cheshire. Oh, she's shot now. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, yay, Cheshire. Oh, no, Cheshire. (laughs) I was, I was like, I'm totally on this roller coaster with Emily. I know Emily just went on the same roller coaster. Basically, <laughs> like that was, it was just such a, a such a hard <laughs> turn. I was like, yay, oh no, <laughs> please, she's she's just a squishy human. Someone help. Nice. <laughs> but because she is a squishy human, she then has to go get stitched up, and then Artemis storms in, and they have a conversation. And I loved that. I loved that scene between the two of them, and getting to see that relationship, and like how it's progressed and evolved across seasons um and the fact that i jokingly called cheshire murder mom last week and yep the scene is absolutely about that she is embracing the murder part more than the mom part but she needs to have she needs to think a little bit about her situation she clearly loves leon which i which i like yeah i like that they made it clear that it isn't like I don't care about my kid moving on. It's like, no, she loves Leon and she wants Leon to have her best chance. But I'm like, Cheshire, please go see your kid. I second Artemis re- Artemis's request that you go see your kid. <laughs> and I want more of that. Like, I want a scene between the two of them by the end of the season. If we don't get it, I'm going to spontaneously combust. Yeah. I-, I need it. I need that closure <laughs> and just continuation of that. And I, I threw this in there because I thought this while watching it, too. The fact that they, that scene entirely focuses on Leon, which I do love and appreciate. And there's this moment, though, when she says right before she leaves, she's like, hug, hug Leon for me, which both broke my heart and kind of made me feel like because shipper goggles. I'm like, it almost feels like she was going to include Roy in that statement and then was like, no, no, just my kid. Yeah. And then moved on. And it broke my heart, which, you know. I want to I want to see the continuation of that. I want to see what's up with those two. I I don't know if I'm up for the other thing though. What other thing? This really awkward conversation about uh Will and Artemis? Yeah, no. What, no, what I'm was not. That? I yeah, cuz we had to gloss over this in our summary, but there's a whole scene, there's a whole little bit where Roy and Lynn, Black Lightning's ex-wife, are are talking and just about being parents and whatnot. And she asks, what's up with Artemis living at his house? And Roy gets real awkward about it, which I think anyone would, honestly, if someone is accusing you of dating your ex-wife's younger sister. Yeah. Uh, but I really this don't thin it. line. It walked a thin line between, like, awkward, like, no, please don't go there with that with me, and also protesting too much. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not what? sure which way they're taking that. I really hope it's the I'm not dating my ex-wife's younger sister because, yeah, yeah, don't date your ex-wife's younger sister who's still mourning the loss of her boyfriend. Like, there's a lot wrapped up in all that. Yeah. And I just I, don't want I it. I trust them. <laughs> I trust the writers. I just that this first step was a little bit like, what? And then, you know, we moved on to D- uh, Jonathan Kent. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's so many kids coming yes. in. Like, like, I know oh some people God. ship long shot and more power to them, but uh, yeah, it's those just the way that this was siblings yeah. in law, and that's all I want. <laughs> Maybe under some different circumstance or dynamic or something, yes. it might yeah. it might be a thing. But the way that this is currently feels not strangely loving. strangely squidgy right not, now. Yeah, yeah no, nah. yeah. yeah. Anyway, but superpower daycare. Oh my god, I can't believe I was like. There was so much going on. I'm like, oh, look, Arthur's son. I was so ecstatic. I've been waiting to see for five years. We got got to see Amistad. Amistad was finally shown, which was great. Which if people remember, we mentioned in one of our comics commentaries in like issue 20. I'm going to say I want to say it was 20. It was the last appearance that Rocket made. Yes. She briefly mentions Amistad, and they never tell us who that is, but we're like, in the yes. original comics, it's her son, and he's here now. It's her son. And what's interesting is that that comic, timeline-wise, is set before yes. her wedding uh, shower that the that the the team threw her yes. as well. So, And that ties with the comics as well, because she had had Amistad before she got married. 
which is really, really cool. And again, I'll say it, Jonathan Kent exists <laughs> in the Young Justice universe. Yes, he does. But that whole background it is was so good. super bizarre how that happened in the comics. I'll get into that in the in specific episode breakdown probably. Jonathan Kent. So now we get Lois. The only time Lois has shown up in Young Justice is again in the tie-in comics. We didn't know if she and in, Clark were in together. A, in a dream sequence flashback in Superboy's head where Superman kills Lois is the only time we've ever seen Lois. Read the tie-in comics. <laughs> Read the tie-in. That is hard to explain. So, yeah. So now we have them and Jonathan's there. And then we've got- He's got a little um, Superman hoodie. <laughs> yeah, a little Superman hoodie on- it's so good. I it's so cute. It. I love it. Um, we also get John Smith shows up. Yeah. Um, and of course, at first, I was like, they kept calling him Uncle John, and I was like, I was like, that's weird. That's not John Jones. John. <laughs> There's John too Jones many Johns. Is, well, yeah, but like his human form that he uses when yeah. he's a police detective is and it's African American. So I'm like, well, that can't be him. Well, who is it? And it didn't even for some reason it didn't even occur to me until he started doing. Um, the tornado thing yes. as well. And then I was like, I was like, wait, tornado is 10 tornadoes there. And then I looked behind him and then I saw his, uh, Treya Sutton, his adopted daughter is standing behind her behind him. And it, it took me through, like I had to rewind the scene and look at it again. Treya Sutton. So he, he, and eventually as John Smith gets married. And then he, if I remember correctly, I think it was Bialya. He's in a war zone in Bialya doing something I think is red tornado and he finds this this girl and brings it brings her home and they end up he and his wife end up adopting her. So like they're just going to town on the super powered parents in this whole thing. I love it so much. I love it as a con can we get younger justice? That's like yeah. all of these kids <laughs> having an adventure. Yes, we, we definitely should. <laughs> Another thing, and I'm I'm actually impressed that Neil caught this as well. At one point, um, King Arthur's son is reading a comic. The comic is Blue Falcon and Dynamut. And Blue Falcon and Dynamut was a Hanna-Barbera superhero cartoon that I used to watch when I was a kid. And so I commented it about it to you guys that you guys, this is probably before your time. And then Neil pointed out that they've shown up recently in another series of comics, like in with... <laughs> Yep. So in the DC universe, so I'm like, wait, are Blue Falcon and Dino? Wait, are they just a comic? Are they, you know, I don't know. Hashtag no spoilers. We're never going to find out unless they actually show up. But man, if, if Dynamut shows up, I am going to lose my mind. I think we all would. So funny. And then we, we get the spinoff of Young Justice. That's all the super pets too. So we get Crypto oh, and Ace God, the Bat Hound and mm -hmm, Sphere mm -hmm. going on adventures. Mm -hmm. I need Ace. I've seen all these pets in the credits now. I just got to I got to have Ace. I'm here and for And the Bat Cow. I can't remember the bat cow's name. I think it's yeah. just called bat cow. Maybe it might just be bat cow. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but seeing seeing Mira and Aquaman's son, who my mind is saying they called him Archie, but I'm not sure. You know, that's a really good question, actually, because I don't usually he's not emphasized very much. But again, okay. in Young Justice, we now get older versions. Yeah, because right? I've been because I've been wondering about this kid since he was he's briefly mentioned in the Red Arrow journals in the video game once and we have not seen him on the show or even referenced him on the show at all ever. And so seeing him and seeing Mira for me my immediate question when they walked in I was like, "Okay, but where's where's original Aquaman? What's mm -hmm. he up to? Is he alive? Yeah, Is he okay? No one says anything about him. And I'm like, I'm all for Calder taking up the mantle of like Aquaman retired and is just being king of Atlantis. I'm here for that. But also, if you don't tell me where characters are, I get worried. Yeah. Um, they actually have him as Arthur Curry Jr. Huh. Um, and so, I mean, that makes sense because in, I think he only, he, I think really Aquaman only goes by Arthur on the surface and under underwater he's orin so i'm not sure so we'll aka see. aqua baby <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> now dr lightning's looking real good isn't it <laughs> it's fine this is fine everything's <laughs> fine but in the previous episode we kind of we kind of jumped from episode seven to episode nine here just because we love these tiny super powered kiddos so much but yes we did <laughs> In episode eight, where we get all of these backwards time interconnected flashback missions that are a lot and we will need to unpack at a later date, 
the fact that everybody is lying to all of their teams is not great and gives me season two flashbacks and it's gonna not be great. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why that is, except for, well, I mean, like, all right, so Bruce leaves because of the sanctions. The Justice League are still technically under the sanctions. The team has not, doesn't even, nobody knows theoretically that it exists, at least officially. We think. Yeah. Um, they wanted to find out if Superboy and Black Lightning had to do with this mission. And so we still don't know. Is su- So they know Superboy exists, but is Superboy public knowledge? We still don't know that yet. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions, but yeah. And I d- but I did appreciate having Wonder Woman be the one who's like, do you all realize what you're doing here? And all of them are like, oh, we're getting reprimanded by Wonder Woman. That's not great. <laughs> no. Like, yeah, no. I love Bruce. Bruce is like already like a step ahead of Diana, though, when she's like, do you expect me to lie? And he's like, no, I expect you to use your diplomatic immunity to not even get on the stand. What are you talking about? <laughs> <Yeah>. Like. <laughs> Like, why would you do that? <laughs> why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> he's he's planning ahead, but it's but it's concerning at the same time. It's it is concerning, yeah. Um, speaking of that, while I was thinking about them having this conversation, uh, the image of Orphan showed up in my head. <laughs> We've got every Robin and every Batgirl. <laughs> yep, because. I'm like, is that crashing the mode? Is it really? I don't know. She's she's Cassandra Kane. She's a person. She's Cassandra Kane. She's a person. Orphan. She I just went through all this in the bat the Batgirl secret origins that I went through. She's clearly in the Batgirl outfit with the sewn up lower half mask, and she doesn't talk, so she's got her. She's mute. Yeah. And there's still a, there's a question as to whether or not she really knew that was Clayface or not. <laughs> and I'm like, this yeah. all tracks. <laughs> Orphan. And and Lady Shiva shows up, so we got that whole thing going on. It was real weird, though, in that in that one scene of the fact that uh, Mae Whitman voices both uh, Cassie Wonder Girl and Spoiler. So hearing Spoiler yelling at another character named Cassandra when she plays another character also named Cassandra, (laughs) Cassandra. my brain was like, I'm just just don't don't think too hard about it. (laughs) There's so many overlapping names, too many Johns, too many Cassandras. It's fine. Yeah, there's a lot, but that was pretty great. And Cam, Cam, Cam Bowen, Cam Bowen got got a whole episode where he could talk. Yeah, good and job, doing good all, job, I Cam. Loved, I loved seeing Tim in action, leading <laughs> yeah, his little team, and it amused me to no end that like all of them kind of had hoods. Like yeah. <laughs> they're just the hood squad. Yeah, like exactly. I love it. I love these kids with their capes and hoods. Uh, but that episode also gives us we finally get a reason that we really should not be trusting these goggles. They're not good. Man, I lost it <laughs> when I saw Granny Goodness show up and then everything got horrifying. I was like, these goggles aren't going to be good. It's going to be bad. And then Granny Goodness, oh, what? <laughs> None of this is okay. None of it's okay. And and she's been there for so long. She's been on Earth for so long. Like I'm used to seeing Granny Goodness on Apocalypse training the Furies and doing all that voiced by Ed Asner, you know, like from Justice League, such a good voice call for her, but she's never been that active, like undercover on Earth before. And so this is implying she's been around for ever on Earth. So again, long term plans now that we know that Vandal and Darkseid have been partners since the 13th century. (laughs) Ah, it's just all making me so anxious. Uh, (sighs) But on the other end of things from these episodes that don't make me anxious, Miss Martian is apparently working at Happy Harbor High, and that's adorable, <laughs> and it makes me smile, and I want to totally. see it. I don't know what she's working as. I don't know if she's a teacher. I think Neil threw out the concept of her maybe being like a school counselor or something, because she mentions having a student appointment. Oh, yeah. But I don't know what she is, but I want to see her working there. I think it would be a fun, cute little dynamic. <laughs> can she be coach of the cheerleading team oh for sure <laughs> please that would be <laughs> I awesome i just thought of that now i don't know but i want i like that uh and i i just think it's cute and apparently uh snapper car is principal of happy harbor high now <laughs> at least until he gets fired for <laughs> not, not showing, showing up, up. 
<laughs> we'll see. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Too funny. Yes. But yeah, that's that's most of my stuff, except for I think my favorite line from these three episodes might be Artemis saying, welcome to the fake your own death club. Its membership is very exclusive. <laughs> oh, okay. And I'm the president. <laughs> I'm the president. Because <laughs> she's the only one who's faked her death twice. <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm I'm all I'm here for it. I absolutely love it. She's faked her death three times, technically, though one of them was not of her own volition. Fail safe. <laughs> she's the first oh, one to fail die safe. in fail safe. <laughs> Oh, that's true. She's died a lot. Uh, Halo's goodness. at least caught up, I think. Halo has caught time. up and surpassed. Yeah. Man, there were so many other things here, too. Um, yes. <laughs> Neil caught. There's all kinds of little stuff. We'll, brief, we'll briefly go over a couple things. Halo petting a starfish on the beach at the beginning of that episode. Like, uh, okay, foreshadowing. Uh, Dr. Jace and Jeff went into room 1616. <laughs> That was the room that they were in. Because when in doubt, the number is either always going to be 16 or 52. Only two options. I have an actual really super bizarre 16 that I'm almost making up. But it's there. What? In Crashing the Mode. Okay. Um, We finally get the answer to Vandal's scars, which I've been wondering about. Because he seems to recover from every other damage that he gets. And so I've always wondered, like, where did these scars come from? Oh. Oh. Back when he was Crow Magnon. I didn't realize that until now. <laughs> yeah. Um, that Dr. Makes Moon. makes a lot of sense. Here's a crazy thing about Dr. Moon, the one that was patching up Cheshire. Yes. In one of one of my favorite episodes of Justice League Unlimited, uh, the question has been captured by Cadmus, <laughs> and they're torturing him, and he has some of his best lines, like, <laughs> the little plastic caps at the end <laughs> of shoelaces are called aglets. <laughs> Their true purpose is sinister. <laughs> that scene? The yes. the dude who the dude who's torturing him is Doctor Moon. It's the same guy that was st- stitching up Cheshire. Yeah. It's such a great scene. Oh god! <laughs> um, they just mention Appalachia. We have them busy on Appalachia. Yeah. S- what? So they what? Okay, got to <laughs> know Neil, what's going on there. And Neil pointed out with that scene that literally they're just all being too good at being villains <laughs> yeah, to right. deal with a problem They're like, right now. They're like oh we've made everyone too busy dealing with all of our <laughs> exactly. other stuff and we have nothing to protect the earth oops yeah so here's, time to step here's in. a giant question that i have okay so we have this star enemy right from babylonian times yes okay <laughs> my head is spinning with just the entirety of episode seven so Clearly. now we have confirmation. Now we have confirmation on our speculation or my speculation that Vandal knew that Starro existed, knew where Starro was for season one, knew what Starro could do genetically because he's the one who killed it in the first place in Babylonian times. Also, Babylonia was in the Middle East. They dump it in the Arctic. That had to have been on purpose. And I think he was knowing I may need this in the future, so I am going to store it in the Arctic and have it freeze for when I need it. <laughs> Emily has left the screen. She's just leaned out of screen. So my other question is, this Starro, was it another Starro? Or did the Starro that they quote unquote blew up did it regenerate itself like Starro always does and escape Earth sometime between season one and season three and came back for revenge on Earth, which is why it was so adamant about taking over an entire culture and coming back and nuking Vandal Savage? There is so much going on <laughs> in just as soon as that alien came through space and turned around and I saw one of the Starro stars on its face, I... I almost screamed. I was sitting in a waiting room and I almost screamed <laughs> because of all of the implications and him going, I know how to stop this. I couldn't believe it. That just that one episode <laughs> had me floored. Yeah. How you feeling about all that, Emily? <laughs> That's a lot. That's a it's lot a- to wrap your head around. I like that episode for me personally. I know it was one of your favorites this season. Yeah. Didn't, Hit me as hard, presumably, because I don't, I don't know or necessarily cared a ton about all of the history of the DC universe forever. Sure. 
Uh, no, I totally get was, it. Yeah, like it was a really good and powerful episode, but there were moments where I was like, I'm probably supposed to be knowing like 10 things about this scene, but this scene is just more backstory for another villain. <laughs> Christopher Jones had posted, this was before I'd seen it. Uh, yeah. Christopher Jones, the artist for the comics, for a lot of the comics, had had posted a comment and said, I love how episode seven is like a Rosetta Stone for the entirety of the Young Justice universe. Yeah. And I was like, huh. That's interesting. And then I forgot about that tweet until I watched it. And then I saw it come through my feet again. And I was like, oh, yes. yes, because we have more crashing the mode stuff to dump too. This was not a crashing the mode. This was just, hey, look at these things. Yes. Yes. Vandal's motives now. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that in crashing the mode too. The Olympia storyline. The Olympia story. We wrote in the summary, he killed her so that she wouldn't reveal his secrets. I don't think that was it. I think that was part of it. And I do not think with that, that's what that is. I mean, I don't even know how to handle all the feelings I had about that one scene. The tenderness in which he stepped up to her and asked her to relate to him this story that brought her so full of joy in that moment when he knew that she was getting so sick that she she could not. I mean, I I, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, as a dad... As a hospice nurse professionally, watching people decline, an ICU nurse watching people decline, like I'm watching this and I'm going, Vandal, this was my Superboy moment for Vandal. This was my moment where I realized Vandal is way deeper in this show than I expected him to be. He should be, but they took the time to put so much thought into what's happening with him. Yep. That broke broke my heart and his and, and cassandra basically t- sounded like she's convincing herself like she's saying oh that was a mercy i'm like you don't need to tell him that that's how that's what he thinks and you are telling the audience what just happened which is fine for writing but you but the way the writers did it the way brandon vietti did it is he made it sound like she was convincing herself which is exactly what you needed to do in that scene like she knows that this is this may end up happening to her someday as well and that her she her father will have to watch has watched so many of his children die and no parent wants to see their kids die anyway and he's been through that nightmare over and over and over again i did there's so much wrapped up in just episode 7 and the way and the way that they cuz me for the entire episode I was like okay cassandra is his daughter who is this woman <laughs> And right. the fact that they save it until the last like two minutes of the episode when Vandal calls her Cassandra's sister, you're like, yeah. oh, and it just adds so many layers to that of like, because my mind for a little bit thought that she might be Cassandra's mother just because of mm. the age difference and the way they were interacting and that and calling right. her like, you are a daughter of Vandal Savage. I was like, that was kind of what was in my head. And then I'm like, oh, no, this is this is a lot more. This is even more. I'm fine. It's fine. When I rewatched it, I mean, the way they were able to get away with it was because Olympia keeps talking to Vandal. He did, she never calls him father, obviously. Yeah. She calls him Vandal Savage. And I'm like, is that a problem from a writing standpoint? Is this a, is this a misleading of the watcher? And it isn't until I got to the end where I'm really convinced that it was not. And it could have been because in that story she's telling about how joyful she is she was like before you became the savior before you became vandal savage and she like says it in this way like father is not important to her the epic hero of humanity vandal savage is what's important to her oh my god yeah hats off brandon yeah after the episode came out i think i remember reading uh brandon vietti on twitter responding to a tweet and talking about how Van- part of Vandal's whole thing is that he does genuinely care about Earth, which makes yes. it so much weirder and so much more powerful. And that, like, he is protecting it because this is his home and this is how he is protecting it. He's just protecting it in a really weird way that we don't identify as being heroic <laughs> most of the time. We don't. And um, yeah, shout out to Ishan Sherwood, hashtag Vandal did nothing wrong. <laughs> um, I, I'm. I'm uh, I'm going to talk about more of it in the crashing the mode, but yes. so let's let's move on. And when on we have our thing. full episode breakdowns, some of the some of the things, some of the things that were really funny to me, particularly in that the the triptych episode that was out of order, 
it was on the second watching because you see these two guys and they're in the they're driving this armored car. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's so good. And they're like, "Don't you love this job?" And he's like, "Well, you just you know, blah 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 blah." And then Sportsmaster shows up and blows up the armored car and it flips up into the air, and everything gets super slow um, from the explosion. And then you know the driver's like, "Yeah, I love this job." And then it was the second viewing that I realized, oh, it's Barry one. <laughs> Yeah. And Barry's speaking in normal speed for himself, but everything around him is still slow. And you can, you can, you can hear Billy, Billy Say Basson Shazam. going, going, Ooh, like super slow next to him. I'm pretty sure he says Shazam very slowly. <laughs> oh, does he? Is, That's yeah. fantastic. Because when they cut to the next Shazam. thing, he is full Captain Marvel. Right. Uh, but the then that means that we're, now and we got getting his ring out. Getting his ring out. Well, that, and that first time too, I was like, Oh, it's Barry. Oh, why is he changing in front of this kid? And then I, it was the next scene. I realized that it was it was Billy. Yes. But um, uh, Billy, and we get to see Billy. He's like what, eighteen year old Billy? Was he? What is he now? I don't know. Seventeen? Seventeen? Eighteen? Know anymore? I think he's seventeen. I think is the right. Number I think he was ten. I think he was ten in the first season. He's ten in so the first season. Five, second se- yeah, season is five years later, so he's fifteen. So now he should be seventeen. Seventeen, yeah. eighteen, around that range. He is still a small, but he's a he's a he's, taller small. <laughs> Yeah, but he's got <laughs> seven years of experience in the league. I uh, just, I love it. Oh god, it was so funny. God. Um, I loved, I loved impulse. <laughs> dad, slow down. <laughs> Quit Don't going, call him dad. dad. <laughs> I was dying every time. <laughs> Sorry. Nicole Dubuque back as Iris, <laughs> and just <laughs> half of her lines are like, "Impulse, no." Yeah. <laughs> Stop with being a future child. <laughs> Uh, here's the speak in that same scene though. Speaking of that, one of the biggest questions I have now, I think the I think out of all of these episodes with all of these questions, one of the biggest questions I have now, yeah, the light knows all of the Justice League secret identities. Maybe <laughs> that's definitely a possibility. They have set up a nuclear option. Ocean Master was counting down who was showing up, including including people who were pregnant who could he could not possibly have known about while he was in jail for six years how what none of this is good judging by timelines judging by timelines actually now that i'm thinking about it but almost none of those kids would have existed when he was first being ocean master almost none of them except maybe like black lightnings and he yep. knew that mira was pregnant and he knew, and he knew that Mira was pregnant, and tried that to kill her it. in the comics. Yeah, in the Italian comics, and that's it. That would that would be it. I mean, even Treya, who's like who's in her yeah. early teens, I think she she's was adopted, adopted later. Yeah, but they know, so they know. Like Lois shows up, and he's like, "Oh, okay, you know, there's there's the next one or whatever." And I'm just like, the implications of this are, I don't even know how to, how to handle that. A lot. They're a lot. That's it, it's a lot. It's every episode is a lot going on in any of this. Moving on to some of the stuff that uh, that Neil pointed out too. He, he and I we all covered some of the same stuff, but Project Rutabaga. <laughs> Got to find out what that is. Apparently, that's what Clarion's working on. If I remember, Clarion correctly. is working on it, so <laughs> number one. Of course, one, it's that weird. Clarion's working on a project called Project Rutabaga. Vandal Savage sighs, and Lex <laughs>, laughs about it. What is this? It's one of those things where part of me, part of me wants to know, and part of me is like, no, never tell me, never tell me that. exactly. Nothing you say can live up to whatever this is. <laughs> totally. Oh, it would be even funnier if they're just like, keep him occupied. <laughs> <laughs> just don't tell him. It's just it's, handing, handing. Oh no, Clarion! It's totally iPad. Right, it's totally part of our plan, Clarion. Just stand over there in the corner. <laughs> Don't play on your little iPad. Don't bother us. Don't break the world. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Neil said he's growing ever more concerned about Wolf and his amount of sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> I am too. Someone, I think I remember someone pointing out the trailer. The one trailer we got at Comic Con included a clip of Wolf attacking someone, someone in the middle of the night. But yeah, yeah. seeing Wolf sleep a lot makes me worried because Wolf yeah. is an old boy, and I love him, and I want I him know, to be okay. I know. Cheshire and Shade meeting in what looks like Roy's old apartment. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> it sure does. 
and Cheshire giving him his freedom, despite the fact that everybody was like, she wouldn't mm-hmm. do it if she didn't have a good reason. I'm like, nope. I got a lot of questions. Simon Stagg, Simon Stagg, who's the who's the industrialist who was responsible for the Metamorpho character uh, in the comics, and we haven't seen Metamorpho yet, but we've definitely seen him in the Outsiders, you know, pictures and stuff. So, but Stagg's dead now. I mean, they they killed him in what Maybe? else was he in? He, they killed him in uh, Brave and the Bold or something. Like they just keep they just keep killing the animated version of Stag for some reason. They didn't show him die, so we don't know for That's sure. That's true. That's true. And they but could it was pull some implied. craziness. He yeah. might just be trapped in an alternate dimension because that's a thing Shade can apparently do. Yes. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Ultra humanite being part of the light for some reason makes me really happy. I think he even commented on that in one of our review episodes about like why is Ultra humanite not involved in this? <laughs> but now we've got metahuman, you know, gene therapy stuff and tracking. I'm like, this is right up Ultra humanite's, you know, alley. So I'm actually kind of glad that Ultra Humanite's there. And we did a whole thing on Ultra Humanite in the All the Gorillas tie-in comic episode. So you can go back and check that out. Because that that uh, tie-in comic issue goes into Ultra Humanite's origin a bit. Um, Deathstroke in the light officially, which we kind of got a glimpse at when Sportsmaster was booted. Clarion Vandal, Lex, and Granny Goodness, who's got to no be Dark Black Manta. No Black Manta anymore. Nope, no Black Manta anymore. I'm. That's interesting. Yeah, I actually didn't think about that. I just thought of that now. Hmm. So that's a thing. Oh, maybe they'll get Ocean Master back. Oh, maybe. Oh, not. wait. <laughs> yeah, Lady <laughs> Shiva kind of put a put an end to that. He's super dead. <laughs> he's super dead. <laughs> he's super dead. He's not just dead. He's super dead. I love how they. I did the thing at the end where they like show her standing over his body. And they like cut to the cut to the house with the kids giggling and laughing, and then they cut back to the to the to the broom with the body, and everything's been cleaned. I was like, "Oh, wow, <laughs> wow!" Give me the chills. Cringing noises from me. Yeah. Uh, once again, so many scenes and and comments that um, can be used now that would not have been on Cartoon Network. Like, oh, you should think. Dr. Jace, you should thank Black Lightning for, oh, she has. I'm like, whoa. I Hello. literally, I'm not joking when I say I choked when he said that. <laughs> I was drinking morning tea watching the episode when it first came out, and he said that, and I choked on my tea and had to pause as I tried to breathe because I couldn't because I was that caught off guard. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's all shocking. Bye-bye Cartoon <laughs> Just, Network. <laughs> yeah, bye-bye Cartoon Network. Um, I think that mostly wraps up stuff. We do have uh, quite a few things to stick into crashing the mode, I think. Do, do you see anything else? We'll throw out uh, Halo has two new powers. Oh, that's right. We got introduced to in these episodes, which she can apparently make uh, holograms which is green. Green is holograms. And she can apparently not just make holograms of herself. She can make holograms of other things. Yes. So we'll see how that cool. goes. She has so many powers. And we saw what appeared to be white, I think, or like super duper light blue that does um, Yeah. My something. opinion is this. She burns with the light of a blue sun. Like she is. Yeah. She, it was so just bright, pure light that it literally caught shade on fire it burned through a shield made of shadow made of darkness shattered that and then caught him on fire and brought brion back no what i think i so i think the implication here is that shade like because he was talking about how hard it was to hold on to that object yeah that we so haven't you think really he, talked about he just bailed and threw brion back into I, the i, I think he didn't have i don't think he had any endurance to okay. hold it. You know, I think he was exhausted and in pain and he couldn't hold him anymore. So he had to let him Makes out. I, I don't think it's a doorway into sense. a pocket sense. Into I don't think it's a doorway. I don't think he makes a doorway. I think he <laughs> creates a space and he has to hold that space. That's what I'm thinking. It's like lifting a rock for him. He has to let it go at some point. I may have just been confused by the fact that when he first poofed Brion out, he was like, maybe I'll just leave him there forever. And then that sets Halo off. I think he was messing with Halo, and then he probably, and then he regretted it. Yeah, he overplayed it. <laughs> he overplayed his hand. Don't yeah, mess with Halo. Because Halo's Halo seems to have a bit of a crush. 
which we'll see where that goes. Yeah, we'll see. Where Brian that goes. also seems to have a bit of a crush. We'll see where that leads. Yeah, <laughs> kids. So I think is that have we covered everything? There was a lot. I think that was everything. There's so um, so much. Yeah, uh, let's. We'll, yeah, we'll get into um, some fan service and then head into crashing the mode. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan related creations celebrating DC and Young Justice. This week, I want to give a shout out to the YJ Wiki. If you guys haven't seen these already. The YJ Wiki has contacted the voice actors from the show and are doing motion comic ads for the tie-in comics you keep hearing us mention. They get the original actors. They got Nolan North to do some stuff. They got Jason Spizak to redo Wally. Um, Danica McKellar did one recently. Danica McKellar, Stephanie absolutely. Lemlin did the first one that they did. Mm-hmm. That was Artemis's backstory. Yeah, they did. They did so much. They did so much stuff. So they, you should really pop over to the YJ Wiki and or their um, their Twitter page. Um, and they keep putting those in and, and redoing those. And I, I'm guessing there's more coming because they've already done five or six. I don't know. They just keep doing them. <laughs> um, they're awesome. So you should go over and check they those are. out. Um, and a, a shout out. We had a, we had a, a listener to our show had mentioned them on Twitter and I'd said, Oh yeah, we've, we've retweeted them here a lot. And they said, Oh, I haven't heard you mention them on the show. And I was for this week's fan service. I was like, that's a good idea. <laughs> we should probably do that. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have your name in front of me right now. Thank you very much, um, for pointing that out to us so that we can give the a shout out in the appropriate places. And if you have recommendations for artwork, cosplay, AMVs, or other creative work done by fans, please email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com or contact us at the YJ files on Twitter. And of course, please keep your recommendations family friendly. Yes. Now let's crash some modes. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. And so this Crashing the Mode will cover episodes one through nine. This is a spoiler warning, to be clear. Um, If you don't want to be spoiled and you want to have things revealed to you as they come, don't listen to this. Um, Because some of the things have already turned out. Am I allowed to bail on it then? (laughs) You've got, you can read the stuff right in front of you, so I don't know. It's up to you. Um, all right, let's talk about this. <sighs> Naboo. What? Yep. <laughs> and they don't explain it. As I said in our summary, we okay. don't have time to unpack all of that right now. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna unpack one big thing. They seem to be implying that Vandal Savage and that meteor are responsible for every metahuman on the planet. That every human who has a metahuman gene may have an ancestral link at some point to Vandal Savage. And to make this crazier, I looked up a bunch of articles because I had read something a while ago about Genghis Khan for something unrelated, game re- <laughs> it was gaming related, and I read this crazy thing. And so I went and I found it again. There is a study that did some their research based on a Y chromosome link study that says that implies or has a hypothesis that Genghis Khan may have upwards of 16 million male descendants. 16 is hard to pass up with young justice, 16 million male descendants, but the study was only based on Y chromosome stuff. So it it doesn't include women. So we don't know what that number might be. So even just Genghis Khan had 16 million. And he's been alive longer than that. So I don't even know what to say. Naboo being Vandal Savage's son explains so much about Naboo being a lord of order, not a lord of good, about needing to be pointed in the right direction, about his lack of, I don't know what you'd call it, empathy for situations. He's here to keep things And how does he feel about his dad working with Clarion? I have a lot of questions. But it also explains so little because I'm like, okay, (laughs) but how do you go from being a person who died thousands of years ago to being a spirit in a helmet that well, is possessing a magician? I have a lot of questions. Remember, though, he's... So I've never seen him. I, I never expected like Naboo is a spirit. He's a, he's a magical spirit, right? 
Yes. But if he was a metahuman, maybe one of the first metahumans that connected with quote unquote magic, and he died quote unquote during that fight, it's possible he may have set up some contingency plan in the helmet so that his spirit doesn't go anywhere. And instead of going into the afterlife, it went into the helmet. Like there's so many things that could potentially be happening here. And I remember the part where I said I was super worried about Zatara. <laughs> I'm like even more worried about him now and the fact that they've shown him and the fact that they made a specific reference to Naboo that's coming back and I don't even know what to do with myself okay moving on the radio uh, broadcast the football radio broadcast oh did yeah. you have a comment no I was just gonna say I caught this one. <laughs> oh yeah the 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 football first of all Steve Lombard is a sports announcer in DC comics so it's funny that they just of course of course they gave him a show because you know deep cuts um but they mentioned victor stone one who is of course cyborg so we've got hardware and cyborg eventually because clearly he's not cyborg yet because he had his accident after season, high school season or in high school. that's fine right right exactly but they also use the phrase the he's all a- not not the all-star team they use the phrase the all-star squadron and All Star Squadron, of course, is a DC Comics title. So either that's a nod, or they're talking about a whole potentially putting a nod to a whole different team of superheroes. And All Star Squadron had included, of course, Star Girl as well, who we've already seen in the show. At least um, I keep wanting to say Courtney Whitmore, but it's 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 a uh, Whitney. Um, Whitney Moore, isn't it just Whitney Moore? I think it's Whitney Moore is her yeah. actual secret identity name, but the the voice actress name is Courtney Whitmore, which is ridiculous. <laughs> so funny to me. Uh, but more that I didn't notice that because I don't have all of the DC history, but I did feel I did notice that they on the radio broadcast referred to Victor Stone as a touchdown machine. Oh, I, was like, I didn't catch that. Nice. I was like, oh, the puns. <laughs> oh my god, so subtle is YJ. Um. <laughs> We already talked about uh, Orphan being Cassandra Kane, and we talked about – so we have Jonathan Kent, who is the son of Superboy and Lois Lane, which is nope, a whole bizarre – Nope, nope. He's Superman. the son of Superman. <laughs> Sorry, I get Superboy Not in my color. head. Superman and Lois Lane. It's a very complicated thing that we're going to have to get into in the specific episode breakdown for this about how that even is a thing in the DC universe. But he's here, <laughs> and there is a comic series right now called Super Sons, which is Damian Wayne and Jonathan Kent. And Jonathan is a baby. And like he's pr- He looked like he was maybe a year and a half, no more than two years old. He's a small. And we've, and we've already seen Damian, who's, who's less than a year, who's, who's a baby. So... Younger Justice. Younger Justice. Episode, like season season seven or eight, whatever it is. And then that anti-meta device that they stole, that has some serious implications too. And I, I don't know for sure, but there's definitely been a thing with the Dominators, which is a whole different, a whole alien race in like they were first introduced in the Legion of Superheroes back in the 70s, I want to say. But they have attacked Earth a few times, done some other stuff. They actually had them on in the Arrowverse as well. But they had a metahuman bomb in the comics that actually would trigger anyone who had uh, the metahuman gene and do something terrible to them. Um, so I think that made them lose control of their power or something like that. The ominous cut back to it sparking in the truck. I'm like, oh, no, this isn't going to be good. Barbara's like, it'll be fine. They'll handle it. And then they cut to it just looking like something's going wrong. I'm like, yeah. mm, no, this isn't good. And if this was a if this was a reach fail safe weapon, I mean, it's. It's not good. I mean, no one, no, I don't think any of us thought it was good, but like (laughs) it could be bad. So I don't think this was as much a filler episode (laughs) as some people might have thought. I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Anyway, all right. I think we've successfully crashed some modes here. There's some other things as well. You know what? I am going to mention this one. So there was a, uh, uh, on Twitter, there was uh, at Odin1Kenobi made a comment to me about whether or not Halo could be related to the mother box that Superboy found that had been disabled in those early episodes. Because we've made comments about the fact that her healing power being violet and is the same color that Sphere has going on, and we know Sphere regenerates, and we've seen mother boxes heal things in the past, and they actually showed it in the first episode even, 
I, I have to go back to see if it was a violet color. If it was, then I don't know. But that's huge, and that was a mind blower to me. So uh, hats off to at Odin One Kenobi um, for that as well. Um, there's actually more, even, but we're gonna stop there. And also, we don't know if that's true. That's we have no idea. I was just well because just they've to already clarify changed so much in stuff. case anyone's like, oh, well, now we know. Like, it's a theory. It's no, no, theory. all of this is hypothesis. We have no idea, but maybe <laughs> it could be. I mean, you'd think that if mother boxes broke down and that kind of stuff, that this would happen all the time. So something, something strange is going on. But maybe there's definitely some connection with this color thing with sphere, for sure. Okay, and that's it. And <laughs> <sighs> that's it. Hey, we made it sort of quickly. And with that, we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. So <laughs> thank you for spending some time with us. Oh, actually, I do have one more thing. Sorry. <laughs> so if you haven't noticed, if you haven't found, seen them already uh, on the DC dailies, they have their DC daily panel is doing kind of recaps of uh, episodes one through three, four through six, seven through nine, etc. I guested on episodes uh, covering one through three and this would have aired this week, the one that's covering um, four through six. And I th- we've got some recording set up. Hopefully this will still be the case. You can check, but Neil and I both will be on the panels four, seven through nine and 10 through 13 is what we've got set up at the moment. So hopefully you will see us there um, blowing some minds about some behind the scenes. Uh, and with all that out of the way, I think we can uh, Zeta out of the watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and at our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. We're everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show, so please do. And if you do leave us a rating or review, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. So let us know. If you want to help us do more in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 